Good morning. Trust everyone's been having an awesome week, enjoying the life you've been given, and enjoying also the life that you're allowing Holy Spirit to create through you. Because we are creators. We create the life we live. And people go, oh, you're not God. I am in contact with, I am one with the source of all life. And him working in and through me causes me to be able to create the life that I desire to live. And you are the creator of the life that you live. The problem that some people have now, they see themselves having to fight somebody or some spiritual being or something else in order to have the life that they want. No, in reality, all you just need to do is relax, rest in, as Paul would talk about, put on, okay, which means to sink into as if into a garment. Sink in, to sink into the life and the reality of who you are as one with Father God and allow him to work in and through you to bring forth the life that you desire for yourself. We are not victims of this world. We are not victims to society. We are not victims to anything that would raise its head and tell us that we are. Because we are sourced out of our Father. We have been given life and abundant life. And we go forth and we live that life. And we allow that life to manifest in us, through us, and for us. I want us to go to John 10. Let's go to verse 1. We're going to go back to a parable we've talked about before. Um, because the Lord really yesterday began to deal with me about the realities that we need to walk in and live in every day. It's not once in a while, but it's an everyday life. It's an everyday reality that we live in. And I just believe that out of this teaching this morning, there will be people who will begin to see the necessities of bringing about change. Specifically, people on Facebook. You know, I've, I've got this friend on Facebook. I don't know her face to face, but we've made friends on Facebook. I don't know how much of my posts she might see. But I just believe as she hears this with what she's dealing with in the natural, and what she's dealing with in the natural is a life that has been turned upside downwards, not by her doing, but by the doing of someone else. But I just believe that as she listens, as she comes across this, that she will begin to hear something that's going to cause her to begin to rise up and allow God to show her how to put her life back together and how to begin anew and start new and live the life rather than living in the past but living in a future designed by God. John 10, let's start with... We'll, we'll quickly read these. This Jesus begins to tell them about a parable. Remember, Jesus taught them in parables or stories to reveal a truth. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now the sheepfold was a place of safety for the sheep. Thank you, brother. It was a place of safety. Next verse. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Next verse. So the true shepherd comes in by the door, the doorway. To him the porter, that is the hireling, the hired one, openeth the door, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. So the shepherd leads the sheep. To, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. There is that knowing knowing the voice of Father. Some people said, well, I don't know. You know, all I know is you know and can know the voice of God and be very much aware of it. He goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. So true sheep, Know the voice of their shepherd. 
and they won't follow anything else. Jesus is telling a story because what he's really trying to tell them, I'm your shepherd. Now, if you're my true sheep, you're going to hear my voice and you're going to follow in what I'm instructing you in. Next verse. The, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. So again, they're having difficulty understanding what he says. Verse 7. Here he begins to explain to them the parable. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. That is, I am the one that will bring you in and open up a place of safety. Up, and we'll get into some other scriptures how he describes this, this place of safety. Jesus says, I'm the one. I'm the door. I will open up and you will enter in to safety. Now you have to understand when Jesus came, and, and let me just say this. Most of the Christianity in the Christian church, all they can see is Jesus as somebody to worship. Do you know Jesus never wanted us to worship him? You go back and you read the things. He never came for us to worship him. Yes, we give thanks to him for who he is and what he's done. But he never came for us to worship him. But he did come to show us God's way. Not another way, God's way. Okay? So then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Next verse. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Let me just make it simple. All these other teachings, all these other religions, all of this stuff that tried to bring you into this place of safety and provision, they were thieves and robbers. They robbed you. So the question is, we need to be searching out what did they rob us of? And we find out later on, they robbed us of the life that God created for us. All that ever came... Before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, that is, if you will embrace what I'm saying and doing, that's what he's basically telling them, if you will embrace what I'm saying and what I'm doing, he can enter into this place of safety. He shall be saved. That's that sozo, meaning made whole, made complete. Now, we've already studied in here that sin refers to a mistaken identity, not living out of and in your true identity. So this being saved, is Jesus is telling them, this being saved or made whole is to bring you to your true self, to who you truly are. And you shall go in and out and find pasture. In and out speaks of freedom. You will find freedom. And you will find a pasture, a place to graze and feed upon. Next verse. Jesus, this is all he's talking about himself and what he's doing. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus begins to tell them why he's come. He has come to bring them into a place of abundance, an abundant life. That word abundantly is the Greek word parasites. It means in the sense of beyond, superabundant in quantity, and superior in quality. So Jesus comes in, in, in declaring himself to be the way. He's declaring to them, I'm going to bring you into a place of superabundance and an, an abundant and a superior life. Now, and he says, and you can have it more abundantly. That's what he's telling these. See, we have to look at the scriptures in context. And that's what he's telling them. I'm the door. I'm the way. I'm the one that's going to make it possible for you to enter in into abundant life. Next verse. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So he calls himself the one that's going to give his life for his sheep. Next verse. 
But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, who's on the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Next verse. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Next verse. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am, and am known of mine. Now, the sheep are the ones who followed him. And there were those who chose not to follow him, even to the point of those not wanting to follow him, wanting to crucify him and judge him because of the truth that he declared. You know, Jesus understood when he said, I giveth my life. He understood that the repentance or the change in thinking that he brought to society of his day and even comes damped by the written word now, he brought to the people would cost him his life. He understood that. He was not mistaken about that. He would be judged by the religious system of the Jewish religious system and he would be put upon a cross. He understood all of that. Now, we have to understand that Jesus laying down his life was so he could show us the Father and the reality of who the Father is to us and the reality of the economy of the follower. Father, if you want to call it that, the ways of the Father, the, the, the perspective of the Father, because he many times would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus came to show us the Father and the perspective of the Father and the life of the Father. And he knew because he would do that, he knew that he would die a death of the judgment of a religious system. He knew that. Jesus came to set people free in their understanding. You see, because of Adam, humanity began to walk in a mistaken identity, not living out of their source, which is their Father God, which they are in union with. You, may, you know, you hear me a lot of times I talk about looking within. When I say looking within, I'm talking about looking into your source, to spirit. Because that's who you're in union with. Because your spirit is his spirit. Your spirit is an expression of who he is. So Jesus comes to set people free in their understanding. To set them free many times. The, 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 Paul talks about them of sin. What is sin? It's mark missing. Missing the mark of the high calling of God. Well, what is the high calling of God for us? It's not your performance. The high calling of God simply is this, to live out of your source, to live out of your spirit, live out of the reality of who you really are. You are more than flesh and blood. You are spirit. Jesus came to change their understanding, to challenge their belief systems, to challenge their traditions. And if you, that's why I told you, over a year ago, it is important that we understand the things Jesus said and the things that Jesus did. And everywhere he went, he challenged the traditions of men and the traditions of religious system. He keeps saying that he willingly laid down his life. Let's go to verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. These, you, I'm looking at you, he's saying, there are others I have. Now, who were those others? Those of us that came after. Those of us today. We are his followers in that we believe what he said is truth. We believe what he did was for us. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd, one who will lead them. Next verse. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. Now let's look at some other scriptures where Jesus talked about laying down his life. Let's go to John 3, verse 14. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Where was the serpent? It was lifted up on a what? On a pole. Jesus is telling them, just like Moses put a serpent on a pole and lifted it up, you're going to lift me up on a pole, which was going to be the cross. Next verse. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's go back to the verse, verse 14 again. I want to show you something here. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It's the Son of Man, Jesus, going to be this fleshy man. Is what he's talking about. It's going to be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Believing in this man that's standing here, he's saying, and talking to you. And instructing you. I'm declaring to you, you're going to take this man of flesh, and you're going to put him on a pole. Next verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And a lot of people say, I believe in Jesus. The question is, what is it about Jesus do you believe? I found out some things I believed out about Jesus was in error. And I needed Holy Spirit to bring me clarification and correction. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That word have means possess. Everlasting, eternal means the same. That is, you have this life that is eternal, that has no end, no, you know, no beginning. When you, God gave you this life, this eternal life. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn, and that is judge the world, this present order. God did not send Jesus to bring judgment on the earth. God did not send Jesus to bring judgment on this present order of things, but that the world, that is those of us inhabitants, might be saved. What did we need to be saved from? We needed to be saved from a mistaken identity. Well, what about your performance? Don't you need to be saved from some things you do? You most likely do. I most likely do. But Jesus didn't come, in essence, to die to save me from my performance as much as he did to save me from what I believed about who I am. Because I promise you, you and I both, we live out and we show forth in the earth who we believe we are. If you believe that the earth rim and people in the earth rim are your problem, you're going to have problems everywhere you go. If you believe someone else has the power and the authority to make your life miserable and making your life miserable, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. If you believe you've got to just struggle through this earth life and be sick and worn out and broke down and broke financially, that's exactly what you will show forth. I'm trying to get to where the rubber reads, somebody says the rubber meets the road. It's our belief systems that causes us to manifest what, what is manifested. Well, don't you have, encounter problems? Don't you encounter people that um, create problems with you? Yeah. But they're not my source. They're not my answer. And it's really not my problem. It's the one, they're the ones with the problem. They're the ones with the problem. And I'm not going to argue with them over it. Now, if they want some good sound advice, I'll give it to them. They're not my problem. They might think they're my problem, but they're not my problem. Circumstances may think it's my problem, but it's not my problem. Because anything I encounter in this natural life, my source, my father that I'm in union with, has an instruction and a direction for, for me on how to deal with it, how to walk through it victoriously and live out the life of who I am. I keep telling you, 
We are like magnets. And I'm going to tell you something. You attract what you believe. You attract what you believe. You see the, the symbolism I'm using there? You're like a magnet and your belief system attracts. And that's why you see some people, you go, my goodness, I got another Facebook friend. She stays sick all the time. There's something going on in her body all the time. And she's got this problem. And, and she's, she's a victim. She's got a victim's mentality. You know why? Because that's her belief system. She's believed some erroneous teaching in the Christian church. That's a big part of her problem. Secondly, she is just, life has beat, she's let life beat her down. And she doesn't see herself victorious. And she's like a lot of people in Christianity. If y'all will just pray enough, you can get God to come down here and do something about it. When really God wants her to listen to him and let him show her what to go do about it. See, when I encounter what some may call a difficulty... See, I don't look at that as a, difficult, a difficulty. I look at, oh, here's another opportunity for me to hear Daddy and him to show me just how to just work on through this, go on through this, and live out the victory. See, I'm not giving up my victory because of a situation or a circumstance or a person. God sent his son into the world not to condemn, in the world to condemn the world. And, God sent not his son into the world to condemn it, but the world through him might be saved, be made whole. So God's not in the condemning business. Why do we want to be in the condemning business? God is not into judging your, your performance. Why are we in the business of judging someone's performance? Let's go to John 12, verse 30. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Next verse. Now is the judgment of this world. Let's deal with this. Now is the judgment. That word, when you look it up, means the decision. Now is the decision of this world. Now, and in this decision of judgment, see, Jesus took on judgment of the Jewish system. The Romans crucified him, but the Romans crucified him at the direction of the Jewish leaders. You need to go back and look at your history there. Now shall the prince, that word prince means first in rank, now shall the first in rank of this world be cast out. Now, this first in rank of this world could be Adam who brought humanity into a mistaken identity, instructing and teaching them wrong, not understanding and knowing their will and the purposes of God. The first in rank, too, could have been the carnal, thinking, fleshy man. Think about that. The first in rank, the carnal, fleshy man. And he says it's time for it to be cast out. It's time for this carnal thinking part of me that causes me to live in a mistaken identity to be cast out, to be done away with. See, carnal thinking has been shaped in you from the time... Your mother gave birth to you. Your carnal thinking has been developed based upon your experiences and what you have been taught. And Jesus said that when in his work, it was when he hung on a cross, it was time to cast out this carnal thinking man. Because what do we see happen in his, in his death, burial, and resurrection? We see a natural man die but we see in resurrection a resurrected man full of the spirit, full of life. Now, let's go to verse 32. The, so when we see this, the, the prince of this world is cast out. It's the death of the first order. 
Okay, the death of the first order. Paul would call the first order the old man. See, when Paul talks about the old man, he's talking about an old way of thinking and believing. When he would talk to the people, whether they're Jew or Gentile, and he would tell them to, to um, put away the old man, he's talking about their awareness. Put away the awareness of an old man. Put away carnal thinking. Carnal thinking is nothing more than making and drawing beliefs based upon what you can see in the natural realm, hear in the natural realm, taste in the natural realm, experience in the natural realm. And what Paul says, put away the old man. The old man is dead. What he's telling you, see, this old man, Jesus drew all of that judgment mentality. Jesus drew everything that was wrong with humanity. He drew it into himself. And that, that died. Now, he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all. That word men, it's not in the original text. So he said, I will draw all unto me. What's the all he's talking about? Everything. Everything. He drew it into himself. Verse 33. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So Jesus in many different places talked about his death. He understood why he was going to lay his life down. The people there, the, the Jewish people thought they took his life, but he knew that was coming. And he knew that they were going to judge him because of what he did, said and did. Like it, he would call them, they said, well, you call yourself God. Well, he called himself the Son of God, and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, I'm like my daddy. I'm like Father God. I was created in his image and his likeness. Not this physical woman you see. But this spiritual woman that you see was created in his image and in his likeness. Let's see where I want to go. Jesus kept saying he was willing to lay down his life. I want to go back to, I think it's um, back to John 10, and let's go to verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me because I, I, he's talking about himself, Jesus the man, I lay down my life that I might take it again. Wow. Jesus is telling them, I'm willingly going to let you judge me. I'm willing to let you kill me. But I'm going to take it back up again. This life that I am, I'm going to take it back up again. Next verse. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, that every person walking in the earth today has the power to lay a life down that they've been living, has the power to lay, a da lay down a, a, a belief system that is not bringing life, has the power to overcome, to lay it down, and take up a new life again. Those of you on Facebook that are listening, whatever addiction, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you see as your enemy, whatever you see as something that is trying to destroy you or, or, there, or any past experiences, you have the power of God within you to lay it down and take up the life and be resurrected in a new life. And he said, this is the commandment. This is what my father has said about me. That I got the power to lay it down, and I got the power to pick up life again. Remember, Jesus is your prototype. Whatever's true of him is true of you. You have the power to, pick, to, to lay down an old way of thinking that has brought you into bondage, and you have the power to pick up this new life that you really are in him. The Lord reminded me of Nehemiah who had heard that the holy city of Jerusalem, of his people, the walls were torn down. And this past spring, we began to hear the Lord talk about, and I heard this myself too, that it was time to build some walls. Now when I heard it for me, the building of the walls is here. 
it's time for the building of some walls. I do believe there are times in, in the natural, with natural things, there's some times to build up some things, to build up some things, okay? But Nehemiah comes along at the time when Jerusalem and the doors, the opening into Jerusalem, it's just totally destroyed. He gets permission from the king. He even not only gets permission, he gets whatever he needs to help him accomplish his task. He goes to Jerusalem and for three days he surveys the city without telling the people why he's there. I just think that's unique, three days. He surveys the city. And in those three days, he, he got, he's got a plan. He hears God. He's got a plan. And the people had a willingness. See, it was something on it. See, how do I say this? And I know this is going to offend somebody on Facebook. It wants you people here. But it will offend somebody on Facebook. We have a Burger King mentality in the Christian church. I can have it my way, do what I want, when I want, how I want. And when I want God to show up, Santa Claus to show up on December 24th, he shows up. That's the mentality of all of this. Please pray that God will do something. Pick a, a, a prayer chain. You mean, Judy, you don't pray? Oh, yeah, I pray. But I never asked God to do anything. The only thing I ever asked God to do anything was, is open my eye and ear of my understanding. Help me to see. Be my help. Help me to see. That's all I ever ask him for. <clears throat> Other times when I pray for people, it's a thanksgiving, thanking God of what's true of them and that they are raised in spirit and power. And health, if they're sick, health and wholeness is there, Father. I thank you your life is within them, quickening them, causing them to stand up and be who they really are. I speak words. and See, that's words of faith. That's words of faith because I'm speaking over them and to them what is true of them. They don't realize it or they wouldn't ask me to pray God to do something. They don't realize it. I, you know, I told Sister Linda we were helping to get in a car last week and I told her, and I know she, in, in, in the natural, she's dealing with some physical things going on and the doctors told it would be nine months before she got back. But I began to, I said, listen here, and I began, Lord led me, and I began to declare over her, not nine months, but nine weeks. Things would be back to normal. And I told her, I said, any time you feel like you're discouraged or confused, you call me. I'm coming, and I'm going to pray the truth over you, and I'm going to declare the truth over you, and I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. So we don't cut ourselves off from people, but when they say, will you pray for me? Yeah. And if they'll listen to you, start declaring the truth over them of who they are and what is theirs. Amen. Don't be begging God for anything. You don't have to beg God. You're his child. All you got to do is just like Jesus did, declare the truth. Declare what you hear the Father saying. But I began to hear about building walls and the Lord began to, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and began to talk to me that there are walls of safety that need to be built up in our understanding. And that's just a little bit of symbolism there. I'm using walls. Not that walls, we think that walls keep people out. No, I'm not, no, this one I'm talking about walls. I'm talking about mindsets, thoughts, pa thought patterns that need to come from within us, from God, need to be built up in our understanding that provides safety for us. That's those sheep moving into the, through the door, the pasture, to the place of safety. And I heard the Lord say, it's time to lay down an old way of thinking and believing and to rise up and build in your awareness the truth and reality of who you are. Those of you on Facebook that are listening, as I said earlier, it, whatever you're dealing with, your past, your present condition, what's going on, God desires to bring you in to an awareness of the reality of his life that is already within you. You don't have to ask him to come in. He's already there. God is there to bring you into the life that you really are, show you who you really are, and not only show you in your understanding, but to show you and bring you to an experience of Eternal life, abundant life. See, 
That's the witnessing I want to do. I, I don't know about you, but it's something within me. I want people to wake up. Christians, non-believers, believers, I want them to wake up to the reality of who they really are in God. In your awareness, move from the captivity of an old way of thinking. Because the old way of thinking will, will captivate you, as they say. It will hold you captive. It will hold you captive and keep you in that condition. The only way to come out of your condition that you are experiencing is change your thinking. Allow Holy Spirit within you to change your thinking. And when you allow Him to change your thinking, you'll get up out of that crap. I'm going to use the word. You'll get up out of that crap and you'll begin to live a life and go forward. And before you know it, you're a magnet that's drawing the God kind of life to yourself. Move from the captivity of an old way of thinking. That has produced death in your life. And live in an awareness of who you really are. That you are the righteousness of God. There's not a thing you need to do to make yourself righteous. You are righteous. And you no longer have to be a slave to your past. You no longer have to be a slave to addictions. You no longer have to be a slave of the control of somebody else. People in the United States worried about the government taking control of our lives. You know what? They can't go but so far. All they can do is in the natural control. But they can't control what I believe. They can't control who I trust in. They can't control who I'm one with. And they can't control the power of that life within me. It is time to move on. It's time to move on to the truth and reality of who you really are. Stop seeing and embracing only what your natural eyes and ears can see and hear. Begin to see by faith through spiritual understanding the reality of who you really are. You are greater, stronger than you have ever believed. And I am, dis I don't know about you, but I'm discovering that. I'm discovering, I mean, I've just turned 67. I feel better now than I've ever felt. I can't even remember feeling this good. You know why? Number one, I've allowed God to teach me some about this physical life and how to take care of this physical body. That's, part, that's only part of it. But something has happened in my understanding. I've learned to live out of my spiritual resources rather than trying to live out of the natural. I'm not ready to retire from the things of God. I'm not ready to retire from what God has called me to. The natural will tell me, well, you're 67, you need to go home. You can't reach these young people. Bull! I can see myself standing in front of a bunch of teenagers and declaring to them who they really are before they get caught up in some of this nonsense of religion. And you know what? When the Father speaks it out of me, it will bear witness with the same spirit that they are. So put aside this age thing. Put it aside. Put it aside. I just hear the Lord say, put aside this age thing. Put it aside. And you know I'm going, well, I don't understand what in the natural what causes young people to tick. I get some of it. Because I, I ran some of them, I talk to them, I know. But you know what? God can show me what they need. I'm a magnet. I'm a magnet. I don't know about you. I go places and I go shop because I get out and shop a lot. Don't buy a lot, but I shop. You know, I just get out and look. And I shop a lot. Just to fill up time sometimes. And I run into people. 
There's this one lady at Hamrick's, a little young girl. She's young. But every time I, she's ever waited on me, she is full of such joy. And it's just a pleasure just to go there and let her wait on me. I told her the other day, I said, every time I come in here, you're full of so much joy. I said, I love coming and let you being around you. I don't know what her faith is and what she believes. But she's a joy to be around. Let me tell you something, you older people. If you don't stop your being grumpy and fussing and all of that kind of stuff, some young people will want to be around you if you let the joy of the Lord come up out of you. They'll want to be around you. They'll want to hear what you got to say. They'll want to hear your instruction. They don't want to hear judgment. They want you to be like your Father God, coming to them without judgment, but offering them and showing them how to live an abundant life. Well, I got it on the... It's time to move on. Build walls of truth and walls of reality of who we really are. And stop seeing and embracing only what your natural eyes see. Begin to see by faith. You're greater, you're stronger than you have ever believed. You have your Father's DNA created in His image and His likeness. Go create the life you want to live. People find that hard to believe. You mean I can create the life I want to live? Yep. Go create the life you want to live. Go be. Number one, who God says you are. But in being that, God says, Honey, go on and create the life you want to have. Go on and do it. Stop letting people, stop letting negativity create your life. Because one or the other is going to do it. Either death's going to create your life that you live or the eternal life that you are is going to create the life that you live in this natural realm. I choose for eternal life to create this natural life that I live. Israel's travels. Let's end here. It's an allegory. We're looking at it as an allegory. Shows forth the change in our awareness that changes our condition. They leave Egypt. They are delivered. Something begins to start taking place in their awareness. They get to the wilderness. Be fed manna. Led fire by night. Cloud by day. Miraculous. God showing up all the time. And they're eating this manna. And the word manna means what is it? In my awareness, what is it? And I ask myself, what is it that you believe, Judy? What is it is error? And what is it is truth? Holy Spirit, you're my teacher. And there is this transition from slavery to moving in to the full provision of the promised land. It was theirs before they left Egypt. God had declared it. And let me tell you something. When God declares something about us, his creation, it's true of us. Our awareness of our surroundings and our awareness of what's going on and our awareness of truth has to change in that transition till we finally open up and we realize this is who I've always been. I just didn't know it. I just didn't realize. It's this, this a picture, this, this changing to me is a picture of a change in their awareness, their understanding of the reality of who God had created them to be. And my Father God is showing me more and more who I am and who he's created me to be. And the most important thing he's shown me who I am is, Judy, you just like me. Your love. And you're just love going somewhere to spill over on somebody. You know, where you work, you're just love there just to spill over on those people. Just, uh, you may not never, ever witness to them or anything about Christ or anything. Just, you, just your love, your presence, your love flowing up out of Him because that's Him flowing out of you to them. 
go and be who you have been created to be. And as you go and you be, watch who you be becomes a magnet and draws unto you what the world might call the miraculous. I call it eternal life working for me. I'm telling you, I feel younger than I did 20, 30 years ago. I feel full of life like I never had before. And because I've dared to hear my father, I'm seeing what was an obstacle and an addiction. What, you mean you had an addiction? Yeah, I had an addiction to food. But I'm seeing the life of God come forth. It does not have a hold on me because it's not who I am. It's not who I am. I live life abundantly. And I'm living an abundant life. Well, I don't see very much. You can keep your eyes open. Watch, watch the magnet of God within me draw some things forth. Well, just, just keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. I live with expectation. I, I live with the expectation of not the world says, the natural says is going to happen. I live with an expectation of God shining forth His life through me. You know, I was looking, I was talking to the pastor a little bit about our vision statement. We are a tabernacle or we are a dwelling place or we are an inhabitant of the glory of God. Most people don't understand what I mean. It just simply means... His love and His life. You are a dwelling place for the love and the life of God to flow out of you. Go love this week. Go be who you are. You can't help yourself. You be who you are. You can't help yourself. In those difficult times, when the natural is lying to you about who you are and telling you, oh, you've got to tell him off or you've got to do this, that. No, you just hear your father and settle your mind to the fact that I am love. And I am life. And I, I am who he says I am. And that's who he's bringing forth out of me. I love you.